I'd like to welcome you back for this uh, second session of our uh, morning on sustainability. Um, we uh, are going to try again with our technology. The, the focus of the second section is um, uh, not so much the technical impact of any one technology on sustainability, but the process of involving people in the loop of making change. Uh, whether we're developers of technology or whether we're users of technology, it's very important to have a, uh, uh, a process that puts the focus on responsible research and responsible research with, with interactions with the communities in which we operate. Um, and for this reason, I'm very happy. I'm very worried because I think my microphone is now out, but I'm very happy to introduce uh, Marina uh, Iroka, who is from the uh, University of Oxford. Um, and uh, she'll be giving us a presentation called Reading the Road. And I hope that we can also have a presentation on listening to the road. Um, Marina, if you can uh, uh, say something, welcome to us from uh, Madrid. Unfortunately, you're not here but it's an example of the future when, when people stay closer to home um, and still are able to share the information that they have with, uh, with the rest of us. So uh, welcome and um, I'll say a few words first so we can at least up my confidence that the microphones are all working. Thanks, okay. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And it's really great to have the opportunity to talk to you about our experiences researching into and working with Responsible Innovation, or RI, as I'll mention it from now on. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the interdisciplinary research group that I lead at Oxford works really to design technologies that aim to enhance individual autonomy and well-being and to actively promote and protect human values and to protect the environment. So we have projects currently that are interrogating the climate impacts of ICT. We're researching into trusted autonomous systems, focusing on vehicles, drones, and the scooters people were talking about earlier on. We're designing digital interventions to um, improve adolescent mental health. I also have an EPSRC fellowship in responsible robotics, where we're designing and trialing an ethical black box to help with understanding accidents and incidents involving social robots. I'm also director of something called the Observatory for Responsible Research and Innovation that provides RI services to UK researchers and practitioners. And I'll talk more about that in the context of embedding RI later on in the talk. So the outline of the talk is um, that um, we're kind of going to look at the, the, the growth of RI, where we've come from. So I want to look at a bit of the history of this um, and where it came from and why it came. Many of you may be familiar with this, but I think it's kind of interesting to go back over these things because they were lessons learned that we really need to pay attention to now. Um, then I'll discuss some of the projects that we've been working on in the UK that have contributed to the development of RI and where we are now before we move to the challenges really of trying to embed change in our institutions. And finally, I'll suggest some concrete recommendations, both for further research and for taking action on some of these challenges. So every new technology raises questions as it starts to become embedded in society. Questions like who benefits? What are the risks? What if we're wrong and what are the alternatives? Who decides who's in control? And ultimately and most importantly at the moment, who's responsible? So we know that we can't predict the future impacts of research with any certainty, Attempting to control and prevent could leave us stuck with the status quo, but doing nothing means that the control of the future directions may be in the hands of whoever is strongest in the innovation space. So what can we do? An RI approach suggests that rather than attempting to control based on prediction, we can think much more positively and much more creatively if we anticipate the shape of possible outcomes. We can see the outline of the future space, even if we cannot yet perceive in detail what it contains. And anticipation really differs from superficially similar concepts like prediction or foresight, because it makes no claims on an actual near distant future. And unlike prudence or providence, it doesn't simply ask for vigilance against dangers as they appear. It's related to this idea of capacity. We don't know what the future holds, 
but we can develop a capacity to be ready for it. We don't know how or when the, the capacities that we've actually developed will be needed, but we do know that we might be better prepared to meet the future. So in this way, rather than focusing responsibilities on whether the outcomes of research may be good or bad, according to balance of risks and benefits, responsible research and innovation aims for science and society to work together and to ask questions like, what kind of society do we want? And how can science and innovation help us get there? So before I go any further, I want to uh, illustrate uh, some of the ideas that you'll hear about responsible innovation uh, by taking a moment to look at the case of genetically modified crops in Europe or GM crops. The lessons of which seem highly relevant to us now, given the focus on corporate interests, academic research, and the trust relationship between the public and scientists. So there were a very complex set of issues um, behind the case of GM crops that you may be familiar with, but I will do a very light summary here. In the mid 1990s, the introduction of GM crops food triggered a public backlash against GM crops and the biosciences more generally. The cause of the controversy has been attributed to a number of issues relating to public trust in regulatory issues, scientists and industry. A large multinational company at first tried to push a new technology, GM soya, onto the European market. This push produced a backlash and civil society organizations, which had previously not been too concerned about GM organisms, suddenly took notice. This resulted in quite a bitter fight between a few, a few large companies on one hand and increasingly vocal civil society organizations on the other. The public became increasingly suspicious of GMs in general, and the result was a more or less complete ban on GM crops across Europe. At a first pass, this seems like a classic example of technology push, and we can see how this might be unlikely to work, but this is not the point I wish to make. A more fundamental problem was the official European government and company responses to the situation, which responded to specific identified risks in a piecemeal fashion, trying to allay public fears by educating and reassuring rather than by listening. Regulators discuss the issues almost exclusively as an issue of risk to the environment and public health, but they failed to address people's fears that unintended effects may be unpredictable and therefore unknown to science. Neither did they address the potentially transformative impact on societal structures, which then severely eroded public trust in these institutions. By not taking account of what was driving public concern, the motives of those developing the regulatory frameworks seemed suspect. The initial reaction to the public response to GM crops was to dismiss many of their fears as irrational, and regulators and scientists attempted to regain public trust by educating them with facts and information. Now, predictably, the more the company attempted to reassure the public, the more the public became suspicious. But the basic failure was a failure to anticipate and reflect on the wider risks and consequences of GM organisms. Firstly, regulations were exclusively focused on safety aspects, where the broader environmental, social and agricultural contexts were not reflected upon. And secondly, there was a complete failure to engage openly with stakeholders, so that methods of one-way information provision were wholly inadequate for the task of addressing the human tensions and the social dynamics. By the second half of the 1990s, this strategy proved to be ineffective and the EU moved to more participatory strategies. The main driver for this was the belief that to ensure societally accountable development of technologies, there must be larger public involvement in debates and decisions. And that research must focus on what Morten Östergaard, former Minister of Science in Denmark, said opening a conference on science and society in Europe in 2012 we need ambition at a policy level to support the best science for the world and not just the best science in the world. And so it was against this backdrop that Responsible Innovation or RI first appeared. So these initiatives across policy, academia and legislation emerged over a decade ago. They began with an aim to identify and address uncertainties and risks associated with novel areas of research beginning with nanotechnology and moving to the environmental and health sciences, including geoengineering and synthetic biology. The scope of RI has since recently expanded to include computer science, robotics, informatics, and ICT more generally. 
In the EU, as you know, where a great deal of fundamental research in and for RI has been undertaken, it was a cross-cutting issue in Horizon 2020. In the UK, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, has recently made a commitment to RI across its ICT portfolio of, re of research grants. So what is it responding to? Well, RI is responding to the fact that many of the problems we face are a legacy of our failing to attend to the potential negative impacts of innovations in the past. Increasingly, the public and media are expressing concerns over these negative consequences of innovation. And this is in a context where technologies are becoming ever more potent. Nanotechnology that tries to uh, seeks the ability to manipulate matter at a fundamental level. Synthetic biology aims to create new forms of life. AI and increasing automation risk de-skilling and disenfranchising the most vulnerable in society. And transhumanism that aims to transform the human condition and uh, by developing and making these sophisticated technologies that can greatly enhance human intellect and physiology with associated fears from the public of meddling with nature. So just to give you a quick definition for those of you who don't remember, RI has been defined as doing science and innovation with society and for society, including the involvement of society, and that is very upstream in the process of research and innovation. That's at the point where the innovation is first conceived. And we do this in order to align the outcomes with the values of society. It consists of a set of processes for ensuring that innovation benefits society, and it draws on anticipatory governance, where both the positive and the negative consequences are considered. The intended and unintended consequences of an innovation may be anticipated and brought to developers' attention in order to influence the trajectory of that innovation. Now, although there's a number of frameworks for responsible innovation, several are built upon the six pillars of ethics, open access, governance, gender equality, science communication, and public engagement. And in the UK, building on Owen and Stilgo's work in geoengineering, the EPSRC have harmonized these principles in something called, into something called the area framework that you actually might be familiar with. So what does the area framework do? The framework breaks down how to consider RI into a broad series of activities. And the first dimension then is to anticipate, describing and analyzing the impacts, good and bad, intended and unintended, that might arise from a new technology. Again, this is not about trying to predict what will or is likely to happen, but within the bounds of plausibility and being as imaginative as possible to open up the space for discussion, even if there is no concrete evidence to envisage future consequences. Secondly, RI is reflective, thinking carefully about the overall processes and motivations, identifying what is known and what is not known, and not being afraid to admit that there are associated uncertainties, risks, areas of ignorance, assumptions, questions, and dilemmas. Being reflective in practice is trying to make visible the often hidden dominant values and assumptions around technology. It's pausing to reflect, recognizing the limits of one's own knowledge as a developer and being aware of the broader systemic context of the problem that's actually being addressed. Thirdly, RI engages. It opens up visions, purposes, questions, and dilemmas to an inclusive and wide-ranging deliberation, including the public, through formal and informal processes of dialogue, engagement, and debate. So that finally, RI acts to influence the direction and the trajectory of the research and innovation process itself. The core idea is responsiveness as an act of responsibility. This might involve formal mechanisms of participation and anticipatory governance, or whatever assists to make sure that science and society are mutually responsive to each other. And this is not a once and for all, but it's an ongoing process, looking at how new technologies meld with old. Our previous discussion, our previous speaker showed that quite nicely. How people adapt and how we as researchers and innovators adapt to emerging knowledge of technology use in the world. Responsiveness is not only individual, but also at an institutional level. Responsive institutions are not simply reactive, but are willing to embrace change in their structure, identity, and their ways of working. The framework that's set out here tries to be as clear and practical as possible, bearing in mind that research and innovation is often unpredictable, 
unclear and nonlinear. And this is also not a linear progression from one dimension to the next. It's an iterative and flexible set of processes. Being responsive includes being reflective and engaging. Often reflection involves elements of anticipation. Engagement can and definitely should throw up new issues which require further reflection. And in this way, RI is not about closing down options, but rather it's a space for creativity, for confidence and for serendipity. So this brings me to the first part of my journey with RI, the framework for responsible innovation in ICT. Uh, this work was born out of the, an EPSRC ICT, the next decade meeting in 2010, which brought together key UK CS investigators around, around the country to discuss what would be critical research for the next 10 years. At this meeting, I was asked to present to the audience why ethics and responsible innovation would be a key issue for them to consider. The subsequent project that came that was funded from this meeting responded really to the fact that many of the problems we face are a legacy of our failure to respond to the potential negative aspects of innovations in the past. Freight really wanted to understand, better understand the mindsets, the processes and the understandings of ICT developers and to listen to their concerns and challenges as they try to take on this new approach. The aim was to use RI principles and processes to provide an ICT specific framework that developers could use to shape innovation in the field in directions away from harmful impacts. impacts. So I'd like to share some of these things with you. Please bear in mind that when we did this study, um, developers had never been asked this question before. They had never been asked to consider the consequences of their innovations and particularly the more negative types of innovations. So the key findings here, because although the project's from a few years ago, its work continues to shape um, the, the kind of work we're doing now and the approach to these ICT issues. We found that in particular, ICT researchers and developers vary very widely in who they actually felt responsible to. These responsibilities often sometimes conflicted and balancing those tensions was an accepted part of their work. However, there was one strong focus on the responsibility to the scientific method and to research integrity. But when it came to uh, being responsible for the impacts or consequences of their work, it was here that we found a significant back, uh, sort of gap, as you can see from these quotes here. In general, there was a view that technology is in some senses pure or agnostic. Uh, it was kind of regarded as being unconcerned with societal values, with political influences or ultimate uses. The development of technology was done for reasons of curiosity or for improving performances, rationale that allows for the creation of a bubble of separation from impacts and outcomes. However, as our understanding of anticipation and RI tells us, technology cannot be separated from the political and social context within which it comes to be created nor can it be separated from its ultimate uses. So the Frick project was mostly concerned with near future technologies, but RI is highly relevant to those technologies whose deployment in society may still be some way away, such as quantum computing. So as part of the UK's national investment in quantum technologies, four hubs were created for an initial five year period starting in 2014. Out of these four large hubs, the Quantum Computing Hub at Oxford uh, and under other kinds of collaborations around the country included funding for a dedicated RI team and so was able to sustain an RI effort throughout the five year project. Our work examined the state of the art in technical terms and how this might relate to societal impacts, but also the positions of the researchers and engineers themselves in relation to societal concerns and the technologies that they were actually developing in their work. Now, familiarity in the hub with RI was limited, unsurprisingly, and so a portion of the RI work was directed towards explaining and embedding RI approaches and, and then thus working with developers to try to broaden their understanding of frameworks and methodologies. And this included training so that developers and researchers were empowered then to try and take this work on for themselves. The research was multi-stranded using interviews, workshops, and a series of RI roadshows that used a kind of action research modality to demonstrate and disseminate the work around all four hubs. 
We also designed and led a public engagement uh, exercise <clears throat> via a company called Cantal, which we believe was the first time quantum technologies had actually been discussed with, public, with the public in such an exercise. Now, the focus of the RI team was not to be responsible for all the activity in the hubs, but rather to act as sources of expertise, generators of discussion, facilitators of RI, converse, uh, uh, RI focused conversations. And our work found that just, with, just similar to the GM crops example I mentioned earlier, there was a belief that public engagement meant educating the public. And some researchers thought that there was little point in even this as quantum is such a complicated um, uh, discipline for, for the untrained to understand. However, others recognized not only that frequently members of the public were deeply interested in this technology, but also that more public dialogue might go some way to resolving the capacity problems that are in the field. We also found that researchers wanted more direct routes to be able to influence policy, to be able to talk in a more agile way with policymakers about their findings as they're developing this kind of technology. When it came to mindsets around technology, we encountered the same kinds of issues we'd encountered in the Frick project, that technology was simply an artifact and its purposes were not something that needed to be considered by those developing it. We develop it, what you do is up to you. What you do with it is up to you. Connected to this was the difficulty of anticipating potential uses. But as I mentioned earlier, anticipation in an RI context is not about prediction, but about preparedness, about considering potential outcomes. Quantum computing is a deeply complex um, area, but we're able to draw on the kinds of issues that have already uh, materialized with AI and with other technologies to start to anticipate and look at some of the kinds of issues that might appear in, in the future. This brings us to the next point neatly illustrated by the quote on the side. Although in many cases, researchers were not purposefully and consciously carrying out RI activities, they may be reflecting on RI type concerns. And we, we call this de facto RI, and it's an important resource to build on. And finally, we came to the question of impacts as discussed. Um, end uses and therefore effects are really difficult to predict, but it's possible to see the effects, perhaps not of quantum computing, but of quantum computing development already. There is evidence now of quantum computing going to the highest bidder. Deep pocketed nations and companies are able to buy up startups, fund research labs and persuade whole research teams to move country. There's also a nationalistic slant here, not only with quantum computing being seen as an arms race, but also with interest from defense and military departments who are interested in the security implications of quantum. You, don't, you may not need to possess a quantum computer now to see the emerging impacts. It's already happening. So this work was related to future and near future developments in research. But with EPSRC, we realized that there were, more, there were more general concerns about any type of technological innovation and that perhaps we needed more general RI resources for UK researchers and innovators. So hence, the Observatory for Responsible Research and Innovation in ICT, or ORBIT, this was created to act as a, a repository for resources such as case studies, providing training and consultancy, as well as being a point of contact, a hub for the RI community. This development was rooted in the recognition that RI must be embedded in practice. And the logic of that led EPSRC to the conclusion that this type of thinking might be embedded in the training of those who go on to form the next generation of developers and innovators. We obtained funding from EPSRC to start the Orbit project in 2017. Originally, it was scheduled for three years and it was extended to five after review. This has been an incredibly exciting project to lead. It represented the first attempt to roll out RI, not only as part of project design as previously, but as an essential part of the training for new generations of scientists and engineers. Orbit has been part of the effort to provide leadership, to support the RI community, and to provide RI services to, to academics and to industry innovators alike. And since its inception, we've trained hundreds of students, establishing peer-to-peer -peer forums for the exchange of knowledge, and best practice about RI. We've launched a journal because we recognize the, 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 the issues that Max was talking about earlier about interdisciplinary work and having somewhere to actually be able to, to, to publish your work. 
and, the, and we've also created a not-for-profit spin-out company that started up this year. Many of the students trained in RI by Orbit come from the UK's Centres of Doctoral Training, or CDTs. And this brings me to another of the outcomes from the, for the push for the wider embedding of RI. Although RI has been a part of the academic discourse for over a decade, the 2018 call for the new CDTs from EPSRC represented, we believe, the first attempt by any funder to embed RI training into the teaching of a new generation of doctoral students. This alone would make the project worthy of study for those interested in the development of RI as a discipline. Additionally, however, the, the CDTs are unique in the UK doctoral training research landscape for the large scale industrial involvement and partnerships that provide not only funding, but valuable exposure to real world problems for students. In some cases, industry partners are funded, have funded students directly. In all cases, partners are involved with students, encouraging entrepreneurship and enabling them to gain a greater understanding of the industrial context. This partnership with industry affords an opportunity to study how academic interpretations of responsibility may translate or reflect into various industrial sectors. Every CDT funded in the 2018 call was required to embed RI into the training for students. And we took the opportunity then to reflect and to study on the CDTs as they rolled out this new requirement for RI into their first cohort of students. So now we're kind of doing research on our own embedding. During the spring of 2020, Orbit interviewed CDT directors across the funded centers about their own experience and understanding of RI, their training plans and their industrial partnerships and their wider understanding of RI amongst supervisory staff and plans for student assessment. We found widely varying understandings of RI and that RI tended to be conceptualized in the CDTs in different ways, depending on factors such as the training that the PIs had received and the wider industrial context of the CDTs, as well as whether lead academics had prior familiarity. Given the variation in context and understanding, not to mention the demands of first year training in other research, professional and technical skills, it wasn't, surprise, it wasn't really surprising to find that RI was tied together with research ethics, uh, equality initiatives, soft skills training, sustainability or environmental considerations, and legal considerations such as copyright and intellectual property. It was actually clear that at the point of study, the embedding that might have been expected from the initial call was somewhat patchy. But it was very encouraging to see that EDNI concerns and sustainability are being drawn in, as from the director's perspective, these seem obvious components of the RI work. And we're hoping to follow up that uh, with the directors and then again with the students uh, later on this year. So up to this point, most of the research I've discussed has centered on development supported by EPSRC and thus is very UK focused. But we have recently launched the Responsible Technology Institute at Oxford itself, and it's born from an RI mindset and an understanding that RI approaches don't stop at the door of the lab, they need to be taken forward into the commercial world. It's very much a logical continuation of the work started in the Frick project and continued with Orbit. The Institute works to discuss RI in an international context taking forward, for example, the, the work on responsible robotics to an international audience, and it's growing a very, very strong student network across the globe. So all our projects are rooted in an understanding that although RI is no silver bullet, it provides a way to draw together various inputs, such as reflection, stakeholder engagement, and anticipation into an iterative and constantly developing process that has the agility to change along with the technology it's supporting. The range of projects incorporated, incorporated under the RTR umbrella really shows the diversity of the fields when an RI approach can be a powerful tool. So having talked a little about where RI came from, how it started and how it's becoming embedded in the research landscape, which we're starting to focus on how it might actually become more of a natural practice for researchers and innovators. Institutionalization may be one way, or making sure that RI is more widely and broadly adopted is, is another, as in the global discussions of RI and the broad range of topics and interests that can be invoked. In addition, incentives for change may often rely on simplistic but influential 
cost benefit analysis, where there is an economic argument for a particular course of action. Other rationales tend to be less, uh, less persuasive. However, there is at least a further way to bring about the change now. You heard me speaking about de facto uh, previously, de facto RI, where RI type activities are being carried out without necessarily being termed responsible innovation. And what we see here uh, may be individual or small group adoption of processes and methods that include thinking ahead, consulting interested parties, considering options and responding, responding to concerns. And if these approaches, as they seem to be growing, become widespread, they can bring about institutional change from the ground up. But many challenges remain over how to expand responsibility work to include issues such as sustainability that we've been talking about this morning and how to embed these into the technological design and development processes. There are many tensions in this space between profit and responsibility, between social benefit and social cost, between the responsibility of the many and the responsibility of the few. Everywhere in this space are perceived challenges to changing the way we do things, and only a few I've listed on this slide. But in relation to the theme of the conference, I'd like to stress that an RI approach must include sustainability going forward. This means that we have to get better at anticipating and in factoring the environmental and social justice consequences of future activities when we are developing new technologies. We need to be able to do this even when we have incomplete information about these activities and to allow for recourse. These challenges occur at various levels of granularity across the research, development and innovation landscape. So as part of our efforts on this, we have recently been awarded in collaboration with the Universities of Lancaster and King's College London, an EPSRC project called Paris DE, which aims to develop a systemic, ethically responsible approach to designing future di digital technologies and services within the dig digital economy that are compliant with the Paris Agreement i.e. limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We aim to develop a digital sustainability framework based on quantitative and qualitative research that ensures design is informed by firstly an evidence base of ICT carbon emissions, which currently doesn't exist, and secondly, responsible innovation targeting environmental sustainability. So I want to actually just illustrate a little bit what we think of in this project as uh, environmental sustainability. And to illustrate our view on that, I'd like to draw your attention to a piece of work that illustrates really well these issues of sustainability in ICT. This amazing and complex piece of artwork developed by the brilliant Kate Crawford and Blade and Jola shows everything that powers an Amazon Echo from data mines to lakes of lithium. The full-size artwork is a huge map that traces every single one of the systems used to power this AI-powered gadget. The map is called the anatomy of an AI system, but its subtitle demonstrates its scope, the Amazon Echo as an anatomical map of human labor, data, and planetary resources. As Crawford and Jola indicate, what do the majority of people use this incredibly complicated and resource-intensive piece of equipment for? listening to music, converting units and recipes, and turning the lights on and off. It's very easy to consider the costs of ICT as simply physical, to focus on the extraction of raw lithium known as gray gold, the production of components and the energy associated with designing, building, and using digital artifacts. However, the artwork stresses that the human and societal costs need to be counted too. This is a close-up of the very bottom of the map, what we see here is one tiny section of the entire process, the point at which an owner is actually using their echo. It's not an accident that the users are included in this map of an AI system. What we can see in the top section of the screen is that the users are by design part of the system. By owning and using the AI, they are essentially providing Amazon with free labor. When they speak, they are helping to refine Amazon's speech recognition systems. Their voice data is stored for future use. Their requests and searches can be sold to advertisers who can more accurately target every advertising to them. All of this is added to vast data sets in order to train further AIs and be shared with other parties. The problems with this, I think, are plain. Not only is the user's immaterial labor unrecognized and provided for free, but the user is sacrificing their privacy and their digital security. This is an extractive process in the same way as much of the rest of the map. 
As Crawford and Jola point out in discussing the map, each small moment of convenience, be it answering a question, turning on a light, or playing a song, requires a vast planetary network fueled by the extraction of non-renewable materials, labor, and data. If you haven't come across this yet, many of you probably have, but if you haven't, it's a delight to read her book and also to see this piece of artwork. Well, as we saw earlier, there are still many challenges in the process of embedding new norms, such as responsibility and sustainability, into processes of technological design and development. But there's also reason for optimism, to answer your question earlier, and plenty of ways in which both individually and collectively we are able to act. There are actions we can take as individuals, as research groups and communities and within our institutions. In the UK, the University and College Union is co-leading a campaign for colleges and universities to decarbonize and decolonize by 2030, recognizing that climate change justice is a social issue. We can pressurize our own universities to take action. We can join calls to decolonize and decarbonize. We can mitigate the impacts of our own research projects on the Paris DE project, we are going to be measuring our own carbon footprint, doing our own research. Uh, here, we might, for example, choose um, not to attend a conference remotely rather than uh, flying. Listed here are some of the actions that we believe everyone can take to move to new ways of doing things at different levels of granularity. There isn't time to discuss all of these, but I want it to be clear that wherever we sit, in the research policy in, or in the industrial ecosystem, we are all able to be responsive, whether that means assessing the RI component of a student's thesis or using an existing laptop for a new project rather than buying a new one. And the vision that I'd like to leave you with and I'd like to promote here is to echo still go and Owen, that responsible innovation means taking care of the future through collective stewardship of science and innovation in the present. Thank you very much. Okay, now we come to the trust portion of our microphone. Um, Maria, I don't know if you can hear us, if you can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? And uh, Enrico, we'll have you start with you. And there'll be a microphone coming your way. Okay, uh, so thanks for your very nice talk. I'm Enrico Nardelli, University of Rome, Tor Bergata, and the president of Informatics Europe. Uh, the topic of your talk is uh, highly important, and uh, I'm happy that more and more in uh, our community, people is focusing on this kind of issue. Two years ago, our uh, annual conference was on social responsible informatics. And two years ago also, we started the cooperation with an, an international initiative called the Digital Humanism, whose uh, motto is exactly to put back the human beings and the human society at the center of technological development. And I'm strongly convinced that this is uh, our frontier, whether where either we as a scientific community win the battle to use our science and our technology to improve the life of everybody, or we lose it and we will give the way for people to establish a, a digital slavery when only few will have the power and all the rest will, uh, will, will be without uh, hope. So thanks for, I mean, working uh, on, on this issue and the help uh, uh, many people in our community can understand the importance of this thing beyond the pure theorem proving or science or system building things that are, are important but if we do not focus on the end uh, end user the end uh, the final application of these things then no, there will be no hope so thanks again thank you okay. I'm not sure there was a question embedded in this comment or just- No, it was just a remark, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, it, it, it was meant as a, 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 a suggestion for everybody in this room and the virtually to uh, shift the focus of their work a little bit more towards uh, the, the, the responsibility as, as uh, Marina uh, very nicely presented, so it's- uh, Exactly, and I think that's an important observation and one of the reasons I was very happy that Maureen was able to join us 
um, at a distance today because these are important topics. Um, they're so important that they actually raise a concern that a, uh, an RI framework could be seen as a sort of technical marketing campaign that to have a procedure to uh, pull the wool over people's eyes and or to have a process that appears to be transparent but is, is, uh, becomes a mechanical process much in the same way that public policy also has, often has a public consultation role, but most of the policymakers um, uh, sort of marshal their evidence to, to ignore the public comments and to deflect them. So, you know, how, how can you build the trust? Because I assume it's all about building trust that Within an RI framework, people not only tell the benefits of what they're doing, but are also really open about listening to the concerns that people have, which are not only fear concerns, but, but sometimes, um, you know, very, very detailed concerns. Do you have some experience on how that trust relationship is, is improved or amplified uh, using the RI framework? Um that's a really nice question because it's not immediately going to happen. Uh, we, the, in the, for example, in the quantum exercise, we designed the, the whole thing to happen over four consecutive meetings around the country. Um, and we had scientists there who were, uh, who were happy to participate initially, who knew about responsible innovation at that point, who were happy to listen and at the same time um, were not going to discuss these kinds of fears as irrational. Um, because there's always a temptation to say, no, the science isn't going to do that. You're being irrational now. Um, we see a lot of it with 5G, incidentally, at the moment. And I think we really need to start addressing those, the public concerns around, around 5G. Um, it's, they need to hear uh, very often that some, some things we don't know, but these are less likely to happen or anticipate what will happen. And we, we think that, that was actually um, quite important because... The, 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 the results of that public engagement exercise, whilst also um, locating some of the more negative consequences to do with defence, for example, um, when you address those and you listen to them, you do find that people start to trust you more than rather just telling them about quantum as a, as a technology. So we've done a lot of work, for example, with children, with young people uh, having youth juries uh, with AI and with algorithms in an algorithmic society in order to try to, to, firstly, to show them that they can, that there is, it's not cast in stone what comes out of an algorithm and that they can have an influence on this uh, and on the design of algorithms and data sets themselves. And that's been incredibly fruitful, um, particularly working with young people that opening their eyes to what's actually the case in terms of algorithmic design and the out of the future algorithmic society, but also that they can have an influence on this and join the community of developers and innovators um, because they understand they've been born digital. They understand much better than, um, than people of my generation who have ways of doing things in research um, that, that they find harder to change. So it doesn't happen quickly. It happens more slowly, um, but then there's a whole call for us to slow down in our innovation. Um, not move fast and break things, but slow down and create things. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole call for this in terms of what's happening in technology at the moment. I don't know if that's giving you an answer, uh, but I would say it's the mixture of people that you have, a good facilitator, a good set of um, scientists who are willing to engage uh, uh, and to embrace what people are saying without judgment. Um, um, in, in, in a, a sense, sense uh, is, is, is that, that relationship, relationship bi-directional? Bi is there evidence that the technology provider gets a better insight into the, either the acceptance or the development or whatever kind of problems, or is it mostly geared to helping society um, understand what the, uh, what the real technological impact is? Well, I think in terms of quantum, for example, there was a, there was a whole concern that um, it would break the internet um, and that went on to anticipate quantum um, post-quantum cryptography. What, what were we going to do in order for that not to happen? Now, that was quite a technical thing. Um, there's still, it's all still playing itself out. Um, we have a government now that is very much pushing technology and pushing quantum 
sort of post-pandemic in terms of we, this will solve everything. Um, we know as, our, as uh, ourselves that um, uh, there's been some of that rhetoric this morning, but we need also to take account of what those sustainability issues are going to be, what those environmental concerns will be, what the, I hope what the next speaker will bring out as the, the, the biases around AI and the social justice issues. And I think what we'll find in the future is there's going to be, have to be, I don't know, it, there will be trade-offs between the social benefit of a particular type of technology and its environmental consequences. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 we will move forward in this space. And I think this is why it has to be a collective responsibility. It's no use any longer saying, this is for the politicians, this is for, you know, this is for users, this is for industry. And, and you know, we, we had a responsible innovation um, meeting, a, a, a symposium, a few weeks ago about RI and industry. And some of the industries are now very definitely trying to embed these processes. Whoever the question came from is quite right that there is ethics washing as there was green washing. Um, but if you audit this, if you, and this is where one of the slides, we need to assess what is going on and it needs to be audited and audited not once every three years, but uh, it, often in an agile manner, so that we are able to examine and have accountability of what's happening in industries. The, the result of the symposium, by the way, with, with very renowned RI um, um, uh, uh, researchers was that legislation is needed for, for industry. And that may be the case, as is evidenced at what's happening in the UK now. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to um, end this session here, but I'd like to have you think about um, what your framework could have done better if we meant you mentioned the pandemic right in in um, helping people understand right i've been told that throughout history there's 30 percent of the population who are structurally distrustful of change um, one of the things that our society has presented is an enormous megaphone for that 30 percent right which which um, which ups their, uh, not only their volume, but also their, their presence, right? What, what could a framework have done? I, I'm sure you haven't studied this yet, or maybe it's not clear, but yeah, what, what could, could uh, have been done um, uh, around vaccinations, around acceptance of this technology? So keep that in mind. That's something I'd like to touch on in the panel discussion uh, later on. Okay, Marina, thank you very much for your talk. Let's uh, give one more uh, round. Now, not totally by accident, um, we've chosen one area to uh, dig a bit more deeply into back on the technology side, and that's the area of artificial uh, intelligence. If there's one area where the trust relationship needs uh, perhaps uh, some, uh, uh, some care and feeding, um, this is one of those areas. Well, we've invited Frank van Harmen, who is a professor of um, uh, computer science, artificial intelligence at the Vrij Universiteit in, um, in Amsterdam, one of the leading European figures in, in, uh, um, in the AI community, and um, have asked him to reflect on developments there and the importance of working together um, rather than just working. Okay, Frank? Yes, so I couldn't have asked for um, a better uh, introduction in the previous talk, you could consider uh, this presentation as a case study in responsible innovation. The case study is uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what's going right there, what's going wrong there, and um, what should we do about it? Um, so should we regulate? This was one of the options also from the previous talk. Or should we innovate in a different uh, direction? Uh, so, um, first, let me talk about what, what the, uh, the goal is for today. So, the, the, the theme of the conference is informatics for a sustainable future. Right? And I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and narrow it down, that very general theme. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about not informatics. And I will read sustainable as socially sustainable, not in the line with the previous talk. So, uh, it will not be about environmental sustainability. We've heard about that earlier this morning, and there's a lot to say about the environmental sustainability of AI as well. 
but today will be about the, the social sustainability of AI, the impact it has on society, the trust that people have in our institutions and so on. Um, and socially sustainable in the AI community has been operationalized as fair, accountable and transparent under the acronym FET. So there are now uh, entire conference series uh, FETML is a, a community for fair, accountable, and transparent machine learning. There is the FET conference from ACM. There is an entire research lab, uh, fair, accountable, transparent, and ethical um, AI at uh, Microsoft. So this is now a common uh, acronym in the AI community to operationalize this general notion of, uh, of, of social sustainability. And I will structure my, my talk along those terms. Um, so what are the goals? Well, the first goal, that's the easy goal, is to convince you that there's a problem with, the, with AI, or at least with the public image of AI. That's the easy part of the talk. Then I will try to show you how lawmakers are dealing with this problem. And I will show you how AI researchers are dealing with this problem. And then discuss with you lessons and recommendations. And I'm sure some of this will overflow into the panel for, uh, for this afternoon. So first, the easy part, convince you that there's a problem with the public image of AI. Um, actually, let me show you a, a movie from the 1970s. I hope the sound is working. This is the dawning of the Age of Colossus. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Charles Forbin. In a few moments, Colossus will address us directly. This is the voice of world control. I bring you peace. It may be the peace of plenty and content, or the peace of unburied death. The choice is yours. Obey me and live, or disobey and die. The frightening story of the day man built himself out of existence. Colossus, the Forbin Project. <laughs> It's making you a prisoner. Shock, horror, suspense. Created with all the technological brilliance of 2001, a space odyssey. Colossus is the ultimate in sophisticated computers. So I thought this time travel would be um, entertaining, but this is a famous, this is a well-known narrative about AI. Yeah? AI is going to destroy the world. Uh, and maybe you think, ah, this was, you know, it was a movie from the 1970s. Maybe we don't need to take it so seriously. Well, this, uh, this narrative is very much alive uh, today, right? Uh, a, a recently published book, AI uh, and the End of the Human Era, Our Final Invention. Uh, one of the uh, recent most brilliant minds uh, on the planet, Stephen Hawking. Now, AI will spell the end of the human race. Uh, one of the most uh, successful entrepreneurs on the planet. With AI, we are uh, summoning the demon, um, a, 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 a leading uh, figure in American politics over the last decade, robots are not our friends. So this, this narrative of AI is going to destroy the world is very much there. And on the contrary, there is also this complete opposite narrative, namely AI is going to save the world. You know, the world is going to be a nicer place if we have AI. Allow me to also show you a movie there. When's your birthday? I never had a birthday. His name is David. I feel it. That's creepy. Whoa. That's so real. <laughs> In a distant future. Sure. Right. So the story here is. Uh, in a future world where we can no longer all have as many children as we want because of resource limitations, uh, we are experimenting with robot babies. And we will end up loving them. And they will make our life happier and better because they are great children to care for, even though they are robotic. Right? Uh, and these robots find a place among people and among machines. Um, so that's a great, you know, a positive story. Um, here's one that I found particularly shocking. This is kind of a, an attack from within uh, the narrative that AI is going to destroy science. And this is a long quote, but I'm going to read it out to you in full because I find it very surprising. 
Machine learning engineers, says Robert Dijkgraaf, uh, machine learning engineers assemble their codes with the same wishful thinking that the ancient alchemists had when mixing their magic potions. By deferring so much to machines, are we discarding the scientific method and reverting to the dark practices of alchemy? We should never forget the hard-won lessons of history. Alchemy was not only a proto-science, but also a hyper-science that over-promised and under-delivered. Okay. By the way, Robert Dijkgraaf, um, previous president of the Dutch Royal Academy of, uh, of Arts and Sciences, um, currently uh, president of the uh, Princeton Institute of Advanced Science and uh, the main scientific uh, advisor of the Dutch government. Right? Uh, this is the narrative that's being spun about AI and the role of AI in science by a prominent figure. Um, so, so these are three examples of, of how you know, AI really has a public uh, uh, image uh, problem. Um, one of the issues with AI is that it is, it, it is set to increase, uh, it is set to increase socio-economic inequality. And I'm afraid that there I have bad news for you. Uh, the bad news is that any new technology in history has always, certainly initially, increased socio-economic inequality. This is a great data set from the London School of Economics. This is the, 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 uh, the income of Italian professors at Italian universities, um, normalized against the, the age of a skilled worker. And it suddenly made a jump around 1450. Can you remember when the printing press was invented? Right. Exactly. Right. So the, the arrival of the printing press really boosted the income of professors at universities and not the, the, uh, as scaled against the income of workers. And the highest paid professors, which is the top line, the top 90%, the 90 percentile, the, the highest paid professors benefited most. Right. So the printing press increased, certainly initially, social inequality. Second case, the steam engine. Now, this is uh, more well known. Uh, of course, since the arrival of the steam engine, um, the, the share of capital in GDP has greatly increased and the share of land ownership has greatly, and land working has greatly decreased. Whereas initially they were rather at the same level. So again, great social inequality because of arrival of a new technology. Uh, and of course, finally, closest to home, the computer. Um, so this is data on the, the annual growth or shrinkage of uh, high wage or low wage jobs. And over the last, uh, over the years, 1980 to 2000, low wage jobs have shrinking annually uh, uh, with about a percent and high wage uh, jobs have been growing uh, at double that rate. So again, a new technology introducing new social inequality. And I'm afraid that um, AI is going to do exactly the same thing. There is not very much I think we can do about that, given the lessons of history. But there are other aspects of AI which cause AI a bad press, but we can do something about. Let me give you some examples of those, and, and many of these will be well known to you. Um, AI contributes to unfairness. And here's an example close to home. In uh, the Netherlands, um, the Dutch tax office used AI algorithms that used police records, education level of citizens, whether they owned a house or not, whether they had debts or not, what their citizenship status was. And they used this uh, to assess fraud risk uh, for people who were uh, presumably uh, defrauding the state about the daycare allowances. Uh, and uh, this went so out of hand and the, the use of this AI algorithm was so damaging that the entire Dutch government resigned over this. And we are currently still not having a new government after that resignation. And uh, so AI contributing to unfairness. Um, here's another example of AI contributing to unfairness. Uh, on the uh, left-hand side, you see a, a, a hand um, uh, 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 holding a thermal uh, a ther a thermometer, an optical thermometer, as you often see in checkpoints at borders in the in the uh, in the pandemic. Um, some um, uh, smart mind. Uh, so Google, uh, the Google image recognition software, recognized this as a hand holding a gun, but this is not a gun. It's a, it's a thermometer. Uh, and uh, why does it think it's a gun? Um, well, if you paint the hand pink, it no longer thinks it's a gun. It thinks it's uh, some kind of optical instrument, right, or monocular. So it's the color of the hand here that is influencing the, the, the classification of the object, right? Um, AI contributing to unfairness. Um, AI contributing to uh, a non-transparency. Now, why do our AI systems do this? So this is from a, uh, an image labeling competition a few years ago. The, the challenge for the machines was to label objects and images. 
what is this lady wearing on her head? Um, any takers? With 99.7% accuracy, she's wearing a shower cap. Okay. Um, okay. So you know, we all we all know that this is wrong, even on a bad projector where we can't really see the objects very well. We recognize the lady, and we know what queens do in public. It's, they don't wear shower caps. Uh, if you ask the machine, why did you think it's a shower cap? There's nobody home. Right? It's a neural network. It's not able to any, give you any, anything close to an answer of why this is a shower cap. Um, final example of, non, of an example of non-transparency. This is GPT-3, one of these uh, famous uh, uh, large language models that are currently being trained. So GPT-3 encodes um, uh, 500 billion words in a neural network of 175 billion parameters. And no, that's not a typo. It is really 175 billion parameters. And what you can do with GPT-3, you give it a story and it completes it. So you put yourself a glass of orange juice and you absentmindedly put a bit of grape juice into it. Well, it looks okay, you sniffed it. You can't smell it because you have a cold. So you're very thirsty, so you drink it. Now you are dead. That's a weird way to end the story. No, it's just mixing uh, a grape juice with cranberry juice. Right? Why did GPT-3 think that this would cause you to die? There's no way of finding out. Okay, good luck. There's 175 billion parameters determining the outcome of this story. Okay, and finally, of course, another famous example, the hand of God move made by AlphaGo in game two, move 37, where all the commentators laughed when uh, AlphaGo was making this move, because this move was obviously silly. It, it didn't appear in any of the books. It didn't fit any theory. No, it just looked like a bug, right? Uh, uh, why did it make this move? Uh, three quarters down game two, this move turned out to be decisive for claiming victory in that move. And uh, the, the Go experts are still uh, rewriting the Go handbooks to take care of the new theory to explain this move. If you ask AlphaGo, why did you make this move? There's nobody home, right? Uh, it, it is not able to answer that question. It just makes the move. So by now, I hope I have convinced you that there is a real issue with uh, fair, accountable, and transparent AI, right? And we cannot, and this is very much in line with the previous presentation, we cannot just sit in our labs and say, oh, well, I do machine learning. Well, whatever you do with it is your problem. Um, we cannot ignore these issues in our research and in our teaching. We have to somehow take these into account. And if we don't take them into account, others will take them into account. As uh, uh, already mentioned in the previous presentation, um, uh, uh, the society will start to regulate uh, technology. So let's see in the second part of the talk how lawmakers try to solve these issues. So this is now well known uh, uh, issues around uh, AI, about the fairness, accountability, and transparency of AI. How do lawmakers try to solve these issues? And I've identified four or five different ways in which lawmakers try to deal with this, and I'm happy with pretty much all of them. First one, forbid the registration of sensitive data. Right, so you're not allowed to ask certain features of your population um, if you are not going to use them uh, in, your, uh, in your machine learning. Well, that's a really bad idea from a technical point of view. There is a very famous effect in, um, in, in particular in deep learning called learning bias by proxy, also sometimes called shortcut learning, right? That if you think you are learning, you are ignoring a particular property because you don't want to take it into account, the machine will find a proxy in your data set, some other signal that mirrors the signal that you're trying not to include. So you don't ask people for their ethnicity, but you ask them for their postcode. And postcode in many towns, including in Amsterdam, Postcode is a great proxy for ethnicity. Um, so if you're asking people for, uh, for postcode, but not for ethnicity, you wouldn't even notice that you are using uh, a proxy signal because you don't see the correlation with ethnicity because you never asked for ethnicity. Uh, um, this is a, uh, a case where you only ask the names of people, but not their genders, right? And now suddenly it turned out that all these female names end up in the same final letter. Anna, Linda, Maria, Carla, Lisa, and so on. Um, 
In particular, in deep learning, one of the strong features of deep learning is you no longer need to do feature engineering. You no longer need to think of the features. The neural network figures out what features are best for making the best classifications. Right? Well, it may well have found that the last letter of the first name is a great feature to make certain predictions. And then you are targeting males differently from females, even though you were trying to avoid them. And so not registering these data sets means you're not even able to spot this shortcut learning. Why is George Bush here? In the very early days of, uh, of face recognition, we tried uh, to train a, a neural network. We tried to train a, a George Bush recognizer. You can kind of guess how long ago this is. Um, but it turned out that our network wasn't a George Bush recognizer. It was just a man in a suit standing next to the American flag recognizer, right? Um, so this was a, a, an early example of shortcut learning. So don't be afraid to collect sensitive data. No, worry about using it uh, in your machine learning, but also use it to detect these shortcut learnings. This effect will come back later in the talk. The second thing that people also in the Netherlands, the lawmakers are trying to do is introduce an algorithm register. Right? Well, first, I think that's a misnomer. It's not the algorithm that's the, at issue. It is the combination of the algorithm, the data, and the application. So you must not register algorithms. You must uh, 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 register the uses of algorithms. And then it's not clear where to stop. So this, this Dutch tech system that caused our entire government uh, to resign, well, it's, it, in the newspapers it was said that, oh, this is an AI system and it's all bad. Well, actually, it's using linear regression and decision trees. That's it. So those are both uh, perfectly transparent and perfectly explainable technologies. Uh, so should we register regression and decision trees? Um, if we sort lists alphabetically, should, should we register the sorting algorithms? It is well known that the names early on in the alphabet do better at schools than names later on in the alphabet, because lists are always sorted alphabetically. Teachers get tired by the time they get to the end of the alphabet. This is statistically uh, uh, well known. So where should we stop with this, this register? Third is introduce guidelines, right? And um, actually it's been uh, raining guidelines on, uh, on AI. So there's the OECD principles on AI. There's the uh, European Union ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. There's the Chinese government ethics norms for the new generation of AI. There's the United Nations framework for ethical AI. And indeed, Informatics Europe itself, together with the European branch of ACM, has a report on recommendations on machine learned automated decision making. Right? And uh, this is probably not a complete list. So I think these guidelines are very valuable. But when I talk to my friends in industry, they say they are not sufficiently operational. Right? We read them, we agree with them, and then what? Right? We, okay, so it says, well, you know, try to avoid AI that discriminates uh, on racial grounds. Okay, well, well, we wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, now, how do we go about doing that? So these guidelines are not particularly operational. Uh, that makes it very hard for, for people in industry and actually for people in research as well. I want to point to a work by a colleague of Richard Benjamins uh, uh, here in Madrid in, in Telefonica who has done really interesting work on taking these guidelines and trying to operationalize them in the context of a very large company like uh, Telefonic. And of course, the last thing that lawmakers do is they make laws, right? Uh, and the most uh, uh, important law uh, is uh, uh, of recent times, or at least the law proposal is the EU AI Act. Um, and what I'm going to try and do, because this is so important for AI, is I'm going to try and summarize what's in this act. That's why this logo is there. This is for authorized personnel only, and I am not authorized personnel. So you know, I'm a computer scientist, I'm not a, a legal expert. So maybe I should keep out of this area, but I'm gonna try anyway, I'm gonna try and summarize the AI EU Act for you. First, it has a definition of AI. AI is machine learning, expert systems, logic systems, and Bayesian statistical approaches. That's not overly narrow, but it's not also overly broad. I mean, you could argue that certain things in AI are not included. Um, it applies to the following areas, finance, education, human resources, law enforcement, industrial AI, medical devices, car industry, and toys. And there are the, crucially, the law uh, distinguishes three categories of AI use, prohibited, high risk, and limited risk. I'm gonna try and summarize each of these for you. 
So the prohibited use, so this is use of AI that under this law would not be allowed under any circumstance within the European Union, okay? So no harmful subliminal manipulation. So subliminal manipulation means that you are influencing the user without them being aware of it. Uh, for example, placement of pictures uh, of a certain place on the screen, or showing you certain pictures, so showing different pictures to different people to recommend certain products uh, without you knowing it. If it was harmful, that wouldn't be allowed. Harmful exploitation of age or disability, no social credit scoring by governments, um, and any real time remote biometric identification in public spaces by law enforcement agencies is forbidden. So, no face recognition. Um, for speeding tickets, for example. So none of this would be allowed under the Act. Um, then there is the high-risk use. Um, this is actually a fairly large category. So this affects uh, any one of 19 markets, uh, aviation cars, medical devices, there's 19 of them. Uh, uh, if AI is applied in critical infrastructure, it would be high risk. If it governs access to education, it would be high risk. If it affects worker management, so hiring and firing decisions, that would be high risk. Essential services, including financial and credit scoring, justice and law enforcement, and migration, asylum, and border control. And the law says this is an open list. So the European Commission can, uh, without changing the law, they can increase this list. And if, you're, if your AI use is in this high risk, what does it mean? Well, if you are in this high risk use, um, you must have safeguards against biases in your data sets. You must, have, uh, you must use certain prescribed data management practices. You must be able to trace back outputs. You must have acceptable levels of understandability for users, and you must have human oversight. And in my best understanding of the current state of the eye of many AI techniques, um, bullets four and five are currently completely unattainable by pretty much every modern AI technique. We simply cannot trace our outputs back to inputs for, for any neural network. Um, and uh, we cannot produce acceptable levels of understandability for pretty much uh, any machine learning technique. Um, and if you're a limited risk, which is the lowest category, then you must only inform users. You must disclose that you are using AI. You must disclose which data you're using for its purposes. You must disclose the sensitive categories, and you must disclose if you're producing the fakes. And this is pretty serious business because for uh, uh, using prohibited AI, um, no, you get a fine of up to 30 million euros or 6% of your annual turnover, whichever is higher, um, and a little bit lower for high risk. Okay, so this is pretty serious business. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about this uh, law, uh, both in the legal community and in the AI community. Uh, Oops, that's not what I hoped. Metric identification, banking, migration, justice, and law. No AI in any banking service. Okay. Uh, so this is wildly uh, different uh, responses to this. And my concern about this is that we are about to introduce red flag laws. What are red flag laws? Um, there was actually an earlier red flag law in 1865 in the UK, in England. Uh, the law said that whenever you were driving a car on the road, there had to be a person carrying a red flag 60 meters ahead of the car, walking in front of you, uh, warning the other road users that a car was coming. Okay. Uh, this, this technology was so scary that you had ahead of a person with a red flag walking ahead of it, warning everybody. That law stayed in effect for 30 years. Okay. Uh, so basically, it stifled any idea of uh, motorized uh, transportation for 30 years. Uh, because you had to have a, a guy typically waving a flag uh, ahead of you. Whereas if we look at modern cars, they didn't get safer by more uh, limitations. They got safer by more technology, right? We got anti-blocking braking systems. We got anti-slipping systems. We got safety belts. We got airbags. Uh, and all these uh, now we got semi-automated you know, lane assistance and so on. So. It is not stopping technology that makes it uh, more safe. It is actually improving the technology that makes it more safe. So that's why I called my, my talk fighting fire with fire. If we think the technology is bad or has problems, maybe we shouldn't regulate it out of existence. 
maybe we should improve the technology. So in the last part of my talk, and I hope the chairman will give me a little bit of allowance, um, uh, I will want to show you a few examples how the research AI research community is really taking this on board and is really thinking hard about how to make AI fair, accountable, and transparent by improving the technology. And I'm going to give you just a handful of examples. So one is explanation by salience. So the idea here is that you try to figure out which parts of the input contributed most to the output. Right? So there's a picture there of a dog playing a guitar. And the machine is indeed able to recognize that this is a dog and a guitar. Now, why does it think it's a dog? It's a dog because of these pixels. You know, that makes sense, right? It's the face of the dog that calls it a dog. On the picture on the right, it's actually also a dog. It's a husky, but it's classified as a wolf. Well, you may think, okay, small mistake. But if you see why it is classified as a wolf, it's classified as a wolf because of the snow in the background. Okay? Because all the pictures of wolves in the training set had snow in the background, this is a shortcut learning. Right? This is basically snow as a proxy signal for the type of animal. Right? So you could catch this by salience. And actually, salience would also have discovered the, the Google handgun problem, right? Because it would have recognized that this was classified as a gun based on the color of the hand, not because of the shape of the object. So this is a, a very nice example. Um, second example, more controversial, is an explanation by rational justification. So if we can't explain our neural networks, well, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should just live with the outcome of the neural network and then make up another explanation that is a plausible justification, right? So in this example of the queen you know, wearing a crown, well, why is she wearing a crown and not a, a, a shower cap? Because uh, we have background knowledge that tells us that queens are closely connected to crowns, they wear them, and they are not so closely connected to shower caps. You use this knowledge to laugh you know, when you thought that the shower cap was silly, but your laughter was based on that knowledge, right? And typically this is how people work. If I ask you, why did you choose coffee? I'm not interested in a neural explanation of what goes on in your head. You're making up a rational justification that is not the same as the neural uh, progress uh, process in your head. So this is a way of constructing uh, uh, justifications, explanations. Or um, good old uh, program correctness. So these diagrams, they show complex AI systems, but we divided them into smaller components. And these components are composed uh, according to a certain grammar. And these are the, the grammar rules are in green there. The details don't matter now. What matters is that these say AI systems are made out of components. These components are systematically uh, composed into full systems. And then we prove properties about, their compo about these components and their composition. So this increases trust because we can prove properties about these systems. Um, or trust by formal characterization. So this is one of the most impressive papers I read in the last uh, two years uh, uh, by a Chilean research team at iClear in 2020. And the, the core theorem in that paper says, a logical classifier is captured by a, an accumulating connecting uh, a GNN, that's a certain graph neural network. It doesn't matter, it's a class of neural networks. So a classifier is captured by a certain class of neural networks if and only if it can be expressed in graded modal logic. Right? When I saw that result, I thought, that's why the picture is here, I thought God exists. Right? This is two completely different parts of computer science, the graph neural networks and training them, and modal logic. And it turns out that a, a, a graded modal logic fragment, which was identified actually by researchers in Amsterdam in, in, uh, in 2000, 20 years ago, turns out to exactly correspond to what a particular a class of neural networks can recognize. Right? That also increases trust because now we have a formal characterization of what our machines might be doing and what they certainly won't be doing. Um, final example, a, a, a trust and explanation by semantic loss. So what is semantic loss? Well, suppose that we have to decide what's in this red box. Is it a flower or is it a cushion, right? And we already know what's in the blue box, namely that was a chair. And we have background knowledge that tells us that chairs are made up out of uh, cushions and armrests. Right? There's a little bit of ontological knowledge. 
but uh, chairs are made out of cushions and armors. Given this knowledge, this background knowledge, suddenly it's much more probable that since we are looking at a chair, the cushion has now become much more probable than the flower. Uh, so essentially what we're doing here is we are minimizing the violation of knowledge about the world. And so we are only expect, ex accepting results from a neural network if they are consistent with background knowledge about the world. Final one, data, trust by data provenance. Right? If you think that machine learning engineers do machine learning, you are wrong. Machine learning engineers do about 15% of their time machine learning. For the rest of the time, they build data sets, they clean data, they collect them, etc. Right? Uh, cleaning and organizing data sets is six, so this is called the dark 80% of machine learning. Nobody teaches this to machine learning students, and that's what they end up doing for 85% of their time. And this is crucial for trust, because it's not the algorithm that's unfair, it's the data that we're feeding to the algorithm that contains biases. So we need to know where this data comes from. Right? And that's what machine learning engineers end up doing. So we should teach them the proper practices. Final few slides, final two slides. What lessons and recommendations can we, can we learn from all of this? Because I, first I convince you that, yes, there is an issue with you know, public image of AI. I've tried to summarize for you what the response of lawmakers are. I've tried to summarize, give you a few examples of how AI research is trying to tackle these issues. What can we learn from this? First lesson, keep down the hype. Okay? And I'm, main, I'm, I'm naming these people by, by name and picture because I think this is really damaging. So, and this is not just arbitrary people, right? This is Andrew Nuk, who was famous in Stanford and then moved to Alibaba. And this is uh, Jeffrey Hinton, recent recipient of the, the Turing Award. Uh, Nick said in, uh, in 2016, a highly trained and specialized radiologist may now be in greater danger of being replaced by a machine than his own executive assistant. That was, he said now, that was in 2016. Um, Jeff Hinton in 2017, people should just stop training radiologists now. It is completely obvious that within five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. So these quotes are considered harmful. Uh, I talked to a radiologist and he, he said, there's never been a single radiologist fired because of uh, an AI algorithm. Maybe in the future, radiologists will be fired because they refuse to collaborate with an AI algorithm, but they're not going to replace radiologists. So please keep down the hype, right? Uh, second, because these hypes feed these narratives. Second, also in our research, we should remember a scientific paper is not a sales pitch. We are not very good at publishing our negative results. And in fact, our institutionalized practices for, for, for publications make it almost impossible to publish documented failures. Whereas documented failures are extremely useful for the progress of science. We tried this, we did it in all the correct ways and this didn't work. So we should find out ways um, to, have, to publish documented failures, which will also counteract these extreme narratives about AI is going to save the world or AI is going to destroy the world. And in teaching, we should teach the limitations as well as the successes. We should teach data science. We should teach the dark 80% and not only the machine learning 20%. And we should teach all branches of AI, not just machine learning. Final slide. As a community, I think, and I think also the previous talk was a great example of that, we should work with colleagues from humanities, from social science, from law, from economics. Right? And we don't have a choice, right? These people care about what we do. So either we work with them or they start working without us, right? Uh, humanities researchers, social scientists, economists, they are studying the effects, uh, positive and negative of our science. So we had better work with them rather than do them do it without us. And concerning our re re relation with the, uh, the, in the, the legislators, um, uh, we should innovate or else they will legislate. Thank you very much. Okay, Frank, thank you uh, very much. Uh, for people in the room, are there questions, burning questions now? Because I'd like to uh, uh, have some of the discussion uh, move to our panel uh, session this afternoon. Um, the, um, 
Uh, I do have a burning question, and since I'm the chair, I'm just going to ask it. You use the example of the automobile, and the automobile is a perfect example of where progress comes through legislation and not through innovation. The auto manufacturers were kicking and streaming about installing seat belts in cars. Um, almost every safety factor that's, that's come in is, is, is as a technological base, but has come in because of, of legal actions. And actually, we know that the guy with the red flag, there should still be a guy with a red flag in front of almost every car that's driving because they're all contributing to the problem rather than contributing to the solution. Does that modify your opinion on uh, working together? Okay, so I think just as I overstated my side of the argument, I think you're overstating your side of the argument because many innovations did not come uh, by force of legislation. So seat belts, you're quite right, but automated lane assistance now is, a, is, an, uh, is an autonomous innovation by the car industry. Um, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that uh, anti-blocking systems on brakes is the same. So it's a bit of both. Right. Um, I know this is a typical Dutch compromise that we are reaching here. Uh, and uh, no, it should come from both sides. Uh, but we should certainly make sure that there is um, this innovation aimed at making AI more fair, accountable, and transparent, instead of only having the legislative side. Okay, but I still think, in retrospect, the guy with the red flag was right. Um, this is a, um, a session that um, stimulates our uh, hunger and thirst for knowledge. We're now going to a session that, that satisfies our hunger and thirst for lunch. Um, I believe we have the same set of guides that will help us cross one street um, to get us uh, to lunch. And we will be back here at, somebody help me? At 2.15, and then we'll have a short panel discussion, and then we'll have the Informatics uh, Europe session starting at uh, 3 o'clock. So thank you. Thank you to Frank, one last, and to all of the three other speakers who are with us today virtually and uh, in real life. Thank you. Thank you.